Uh, the Public Safety and Equity Advisory Committee for December 7th is called to order. Uh, and I'll do roll call. Carol Allen. She's here. Here. Um, Woodrick Tyrell. Present. Uh, Jenny Abling. Shelby Sapperson. Here. Um, Twyla is excused. Mary Hall. Here. Shira Lee Winter. Here. And Wade basically is excused. Okay. Um, next we have, um, and it's on your desk, but I'm going to read it to put it into the record. Um, it came as an email to the committee. Uh, the sidewalks on Bus Buxton are constantly overgrown with resident plants and weeds. Trees are also very low hanging all the way up on Buxton. It is a busy road and pedestrians are not safe as they have to duck or step into the road at certain points. The construction <clears throat> at the Wayfinder Pub House is also causing blockage on Buxton sidewalks. And that was from Taylor Rose. And um, it says Taylor Rice. Rice. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. And this has been referred, um, Sarah has referred it to the code officer to investigate. So, Where's when did we get that email? Because I don't see an email in my email. Um, it didn't come as an email. She left it on the table today. So, what's the cross rates again? It's all of Buxton. Oh, Buxton. All of Buxton? Yeah. Is this something that public safety uh, deals with, or is this code? Yeah, Sarah said we usually don't deal with this type of thing, and that's why she referred it to the code officer. Okay. So. And it sounds like it could be referred to public works as well, maybe. But code for yeah, okay. for, uh, the trees. Uh, if they're public trees, I don't know. Yeah. They might be private trees. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, In the past, um, if it was a tree issue, we always referred it to parks, because I would call parks. Okay, I'll, I'll double check with Sarah and see um, whose trees they are, too. Did Sarah give it to us? No, Sarah gave it to the code officer. And then, okay. But it was addressed to us, so I have to put it into record. Oh. But um, I'll follow up with Sarah and see if um, other people need notified. Question, um, do we have a standard service level agreement? So when somebody asks us to do something, we know when we should respond by or? Um, in the past, this is the, really the only second public thing I've gotten. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I referred one to Ray and asked Ray. And again, it wasn't really in our, because it had to do with Multnomah County and uh, all, all sorts of different areas. Okay. So. Right, I just, I want to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, if someone asks us what to do, we should know when we should be yeah. responding by. And, so if and, they do ask us and it's not in ours, then I refer it or Sarah will refer it to whoever 
you're supposed to. But if it's public, if they're sending it to us, we, I read it in the public record. Okay. And then we note who it was sent to. Okay. Um, no, are you ready for the law enforcement reports? I think so. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, chair members of the committee i am going to do a few things or a couple <laughs> things today uh, first i'll go over the normal statistical data that we provide um, and then i'm going to address some requests from uh, last meeting which one was for a heat map of uh, regarding traffic incidents traffic crashes so i have attached that and it should be in your packets so i'll go over that a little bit and then there was also a question about the uh, crime data map on the sheriff's office website so assuming that i've got everything set up here to share properly i'll i'll go over that with you all as well and i'll try to go through this in the order that it's in this in your guidebooks okay thank you <clears throat> So this is for the month of November, November 1st through November 30th. Um, the current 30 day period, there was 657 uh, calls or incidents. That's down from 699 in the previous 30 day period and substantially down over the previous year's 30 day average of 770 calls. As I looked over those calls, I tried to look where there were changes, and I can tell you that just across the board, there was a reduction in calls for service. So that was everything from a reduction in uh, welfare check calls to suspicious vehicles. So there was just a general reduction in, in calls for service. <clears throat> Those calls broke down to 312 dispatched calls and 345 self-initiated calls. Um, of the dispatch calls for service, 51 of them were emergency calls, priority one or two, and 257 of them <clears throat> were non-emergency calls. Moving on to the, and I'm just confirming, it's the same as in your book. Unfortunately, I'm not a creature of habit, so. <clears throat> is the traffic accident report so i looked over the traffic accident report as i usually do to kind of identify if there's spots that we're seeing repeated accidents for, uh, or patterns um, and there were a few accidents that occurred on frontage road um, i think three of which were associated with 257th in frontage um, those were the main three that popped out as uh, being in the same area or, or occurring in the same place. Moving on to stolen vehicles. So there were six stolen vehicles reported in this 30 day period. Um, five in the previous 30 day period. <clears throat> However, the uh, yearly average is seven. So we're still underneath the yearly average. And onto the next page of vehicles reported stolen that were recovered, there was four stolen vehicles reported uh, or recovered. And for some reason it didn't provide the data on the uh, previous 30 day period. So I'll have to research that and get that to you at a later time. Uh, but the previous year's average was 1.9. Um, in a given 30 day period of vehicles recovered. Traffic stops made in the city of Troutdale, there were a total of 152. 122 of those warnings were issued, 19 of those were issued non criminal citations, four resulted in arrest. Uh, four additional ones resulted in some type of crime report being written. 
Um, and one of them was a site in lieu arrest. So somebody was given a criminal citation in, in lieu of being arrested. That's an example of that. Of a site in lieu arrest? Yeah. Um, well, if somebody were, had a, well, potentially it could be a DUI and somebody goes through the DUI process and as opposed to lodging them in jail, they're given a, a criminal citation to appear in court. So that could be a particular example. But essentially, uh, many things that our deputies have the ability to cite in lieu, especially with the uh, population of our jail. And sometimes that's based on how the jail population currently is. And so uh, they'll make a decision on whether it makes more sense for everybody involved for that individual to be cited or to be actually lodged in jail. Mm -hmm. um, there were uh, detectives closed one case that they received a referral from a Troutdale case that, that was from this month. So. Um, one of the November cases that was referred to them was closed, and they closed an additional two cases from Troutdale that had been previously um, referred to them. So as you can see in the um, chart above, it shows all the new Troutdale cases that had been referred or assigned to detectives. Uh, this is the DHS referral. What is, that, is that for children or what is DHS? Yeah, so anytime DHS receives any kind of referral, so somebody calls in and potentially makes a complaint about a neighbor or a student or anything like that, DHS creates a referral that then comes to our detectives for follow-up. Um, our detectives will do the follow-up and see if there's a criminal component to whatever occurred, and they'll, then they will coordinate and uh, partner with DHS on that. So that's what these are, is where DHS has received some information, they forwarded it to our detective unit to see if there's a criminal component to it. So, um, so DHS, would it be uh, children only, or could this also be elders? Or It could be. Anybody yeah, so that would, really yeah, famous. anybody that okay. could potentially fall under uh, DHS's jurisdiction. So it could be um, people who may be suffering from a disability or uh, elderly individuals or children. But it's referred to um, the sheriff's office if there seems to be maybe a criminal element. Otherwise, so they refer them to they refer them all, all to us. To, oh. So we get them all, and then you know they DHS is going to continue on and manage the case through their. Um, policy and, and procedures and they refer all those cases to us at the same time they're doing that and then we evaluate the case to see if there is a criminal component to that case okay. and then we'll coordinate with them if there is a criminal compo component we'll collaborate with them on that investigation if there's not we'll just contact them and let them know there wasn't a criminal component to this and it should be managed under their authority okay. <clears throat> Is there a difference between like, um, is DHS could could initiate something based on an institution like a aging community center? Sure. Right. So it wouldn't necessarily be Billy Joe Bob, a unique individual. It could be an entity, right? Okay. Most of the ones that we are getting are specific to an individual yeah. or. Um, usually a specific uh, maybe single family residence and or apartment, something okay. like that. But okay. it's usually pretty specific to an individual that they've gotten some information on. And I think that, double check here to make sure that wraps up our statistical portion of that. Well, I think there was one page, maybe I missed it, but it was the, um... Community policing context. Okay, yeah, community policing context. So those could be anything from 
when uh, the community resource deputy, maybe he just stops by a local business to go in and chat and see how things are going. Um, oftentimes, if I'm out and go to a meeting with uh, a member of the community or, or things like that, those will go in there. So, um, although they don't always get put in there, so that number can be a little bit misleading because it's all based on if we actually let dispatch know. And with that being said, we try not to inundate dispatch with non-emergency information when we don't have to. So a lot of times um, those community policing contacts won't be shown in there, but that just gives you kind of an example of the amount of time that was spent on any given community uh, placing contact, where that contact occurred and the date that it occurred. So uh, as an example, although I don't put myself out here with this batch, this would be considered a community meeting. So this would fall under uh, community contact. If uh, I meet with a local business owner just to talk about some of the challenges in the community or some good things that are happening in the community, that would be included in here. So it's those types of things. You could then be sitting like and having lunch with them or something like that. And it could be exactly okay. or so, like I attend the uh, the tree lighting over the weekend that is considered a community contact. So basically anything that's a non criminal encounter with the community. Okay. If you're done with your stats, can I ask you maybe because I forgot my glasses, I can't see it, but upon entering my neighborhood on what I believe was Saturday, the 25th of November, there was um, a large presence of police. It's a bit more Saturday, the 25th. In oh. my neighborhood? Oh, I don't know. It looks like it's on. They were out, they were on 24th and 22nd. And the skinny uh, was something about possibly shooting of somebody, shooting at somebody, a gun. There was lots of info flying out there and unsure, but I'm not necessarily seeing anything on here. So I'm just wondering. Saturday the 25th of November, what was the location it was at? Um, so the McGinnis and 22nd and 24th. Well, I didn't physically look on McGinnis, but the vehicles were on, police cars were on 22nd and on 24th. Is that, uh, I, as I recall, that's kind of behind the Home Depot there, correct? Home Depot is the one that runs, uh, the street that runs kind of almost next to it, not right. quite, and goes by is Safeway. Is that the disturbance is on here? Well, I, I don't know because. Yeah, it's hard to say because it depends on where the call was listed as the address, so who may have called. So if somebody did actually call from, say, example, the Home Depot to report it, it would show on there. Um, so I'll double check and see if I can get um, more specific info on that incident that occurred at McGinnis. Okay, because I see priority two, priority three, priority two, I think if my eyes seem right. Would it not be something more than that? No, it would probably be a priority one or priority two if there were multiple deputies responding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right, I'll look you. more into that and let you know what I find out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I mean, it could very be well be uh, the thing that I would see would be the closest would be that uh, disturbance. Do you, what time about was that? Do you remember that it occurred? Um, I think I was trying to remember exactly about what time we were coming home. It was already dark, maybe seven. Okay. Um, As the closest thing I would see would be that uh, one, which would be down the street a little bit, but it's shown as two five six nine one Southeast Stark, um, and it's a disturbance. And um, I don't know if you see that on your documentation there. Yeah, I just think it, I think it showed it and it was still a priority two, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's very likely it could be a priority two. Priority ones and twos are emergency calls for service. Okay. Um, is, it, is it incident number 50759? Yeah, that's okay. the one that would, 
So that would have been basically just, you know, almost there to the corner of uh, at 257 and Stark. So it could have been any of those businesses in that business complex. Um, okay, so the, the police sitting down on 22nd and the 24th would just be backing up what was taking place further up? That's possible, or they could be either back, you know, uh, just waiting there to be called forward or could be uh, setting up a perimeter. It, it's hard to say, or they could be expecting that someone might be leaving the scene that they were going to. So they might be setting up to prevent that from happening okay. or to prevent somebody from leaving. I see if I can see. I think it's really interesting. Two hit and runs though that are really the same intersection 45 minutes apart basically yeah i actually i actually highlighted those to discuss because i noticed that as well um and they as i recall they were both pedestrian struck hit and runs so um one of them i think the individual returned to the scene and so they were they were able to do a appropriate exchange of information and in one of them it appears that uh the and an arrest was made. So I'm assuming that person did not return to the scene as they're uh, required by law. Yeah. But I noted that as well. Yeah, that first one is response time of 13 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so close. Look, at it's on Kendall Shore, okay. which is right here. I mean, right. well, isn't, I'm sorry, isn't that where they come in here to make the report? On, the oh, I'm looking at one that occurred at 25135 Southeast Stark. And then I'm looking at one that occurred at 25691 Southeast Stark, which are literally just a short distance away. I think we're looking at the two that occurred at 200 Kendall. Yeah, the yeah. ones that happened 45 minutes yeah, apart. Yeah, 45 minutes right. apart. Right, so, and that is true. It's if, right here by the police station. Yeah, <laughs> we could have, um, sometimes when people come in here to report, it will say, the CAD data that if this is pulled from will show that they reported yeah, up here. Okay. So, so it, in that case, it could potentially be a lock-in customer and oh, okay. they get listed as here. Now, when the deputy, of course, makes that contact and writes the report, then we get the actual address of the location of occurrence. Okay. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that that can sometimes skew the numbers a little bit because people may not be coming in here for an incident that occurred in Troutdale. They may come in here for an incident that occurred in Wood Village or Fairview, but because the office is here, they may come in here and make that report. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is our records unit, when those people come in to make that report, they'll try to notify dispatch of the jurisdiction or the municipality in which it occurred so that the, but dispatch doesn't always pick that up and get that in there, right? Oh, so okay. oh. sometimes we may have an abundance of calls that really had nothing to do with Troutdale, except they were reported here in Troutdale. Oh, okay. okay. Um, if I could yeah. just um, say that, so a little bit of the skinny on one of those neighbor reports was, I am on the end of McGinnis by 22nd, drove by the team of two vehicles. One was a SWAT vehicle, another was a minivan full of officers. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with this incident now with that, those specifics. So we did have a very brief SWAT uh, response to an individual in a vehicle uh, parked along, I guess it would have been McGinnis there. Okay. Kind of right, by, right near the Home Depot there. And that individual was taken into custody. They were not a Troutdale resident, they just happened to be in Troutdale. Okay. Um, I, as I looked over, so we already kind of dug into it, but um, I did note uh, that the two hit and runs, although they were different ones than the ones you were talking about, and those were both the ones with a uh, where there was an injury and it was uh, involving a pedestrian, and both those um, occurred in about the two hundred and fifty thousand block of uh, Stark Street. So um, I just thought. With the recent interest in traffic accidents, that stood out to me. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, one of those, the driver returned to the scene and was able to exchange that information. So a, a police report was generated. However, no arrest was made. And in the other one, an arrest was made. So those were both resolved. The only other thing I thought that, uh, that was kind of interesting on here that you don't often see is that there was a plane aircraft related incident uh, that occurred on the 5th of November. And in that particular case, an individual had called thinking that they potentially had seen a helicopter go down. Um, when our deputies uh, went to check out the area, they didn't ob find obviously any helicopter that had gone down. So likely it was just a uh, the, the helicopter school down there training and they oftentimes will go and land in different areas and yeah. change altitudes. So it can sometimes appear like they may be uh, going down, but we didn't find any. So just something of interest. Mm -hmm. um, if there's no other questions about that, I wanted to talk about the crash heat map. All right. So you all have the crash heat map. So what I'll tell you about this heat map is that obviously adding the heat map component to it makes it a little bit difficult to actually see the streaks. So this is an overview. The, the, top, uh, the top picture is an overview of, excuse me, all Trobdale crashes year to date that actually required a police report and a police report was generated. The, one below that is all Troutdale crashes, uh, Troutdale crashes year to date that were reported to BOIC. So in any, so basically a call was made about a traffic crash in any way, shape, or form. It got got to BOIC and was dispatched to our deputies. So those sometimes are crashes where they they don't meet the um, statutory requirements to actually have a report uh, written by law enforcement. Um, or they could potentially be someone thought a crash occurred or they hear what sounds like a traffic crash because we get that a lot people hear tires squealing or something like that and they'll call in the crash so it that could be the those so I included both these because I think the better um, better kind of way to calculate how many crashes are really occurring are those ones when our deputies are actually writing reports on them so that would be the top photo um, no, Chief, is a lot of times a police report is required for an insurance claim. So if there is a significant damage amount, someone's going to want to get a police report so they can submit for a complaint. Yeah, a lot of times the insurance will ask for a police report, and, and we do a lot of times write courtesy reports for not for necessarily insurance company, but for the individual involved in the crash that would like a report for their insurance company. Um, but that they may want one for something that doesn't necessarily meet the statutory guide, the guidelines for writing a police report. So, but we do try to accommodate those courtesy requests if, if we can. Yes. So I just want to make, I just want a little clarification on that because when two different agencies, but when I work with Portland, they don't write reports. Yeah, I don't think Portland even goes to non-injury crashes anymore. We still go to every- So I was just wanting, so yeah. you guys out here do. Yeah, we so absolutely go to every crash that's called in, um, <laughs> regardless of whether it's an injury or non-injury. But you just don't always write the report, just if that. We don't, yeah, it's just gonna depend on whether that because like you said, some of those are non-injury where it's maybe just a minor fender bender or <laughs> something like that. So it may not require a report by statute. So we wouldn't write them in that case or may not necessarily write them in that case. Yeah. Do you find that you sometimes go to <clears throat> reported crashes and the parties have already left the scene? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people will uh, make the appropriate exchange of information and they'll leave before we even yeah. get there or they'll pull off down the street to somewhere else and exchange <laughs> that information and when we get to the location where the crash was called in there's nobody there anymore right. so, okay. so it still counts as one of the, the called in called in right yeah you don't have to write a report 
So that would be on the bottom photo. Okay. Um, all those. So as an example, um, you can see there's a section kind of along I 84 there on the top one where you see the number 19. Um, that's the number of actual crash reports that were written in that little section of I 84 uh, this year. Mm -hmm. If you look at that roughly same location along I 84, you'll see there were actually 69 crashes reported uh, via, via uh, BOIC at that roughly same location. Um, so many of those, now granted, this is in order to get the entire city in a something that I could actually get in here for you to see, it has to be pretty small. So that covers a pretty broad area, but the point being that you know, oftentimes on I-84, if there's a crash, people will pull off at the exit. So they'll actually, the crash may be called in up on I-84, but they've pulled off down on to the truck stops or something like that to, to get away from the freeway. So, um, but it just shows you that there's a distinct difference between the number of crashes reported and the number of crashes that we actually arrive and write a police report on. And the other thing I wanted to add was that certainly I can get more specific information and give you, this is a very general overview of the city with some very broad areas outlined. Um, if there's areas that are specific, maybe you wanted to know specifically what at 257th and Columbia River Highway, we can certainly uh, pare that down to have that specific location. I just couldn't do that and still do a citywide map that was able to fit in this room. So um, if there is places where you want more specific inf information about a location to find out what the crash data is for there, we can certainly piece those out into smaller sections and bring you smaller sections of data. Let me see if I can share this. Let's see if I've had any luck. I think for myself, I need to have something more than what I'm seeing. Um, I think I can't quite make sense of, um, like, yeah, like particular locations. Yeah, and so that's, when we talk I mean, about 257th, if I see all the spots on 257 that proper, as opposed to it in kind of encompassing an area, it, I'm not sure if that's clear what I'm saying. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. I just have to know what those areas are. Yeah, I can't just sure. randomly pick areas throughout the city. And I mean, I need to know what areas you all were interested in looking at, and then I can provide you specific data. Um, I just realized that the um, thing shut off up here. I was thinking, Carol, I haven't seen her the whole time. Yeah. I didn't even watch it over here. <laughs> Yeah, I have all these computer screens here, so I don't even notice it, but let me uh, make sure it's... Yeah, Candy, Carol, Sandy, and Paul. Oh, and Paul, okay. I'm going to start wearing a okay. visor. <laughs> I hear something that turned on. See you really those flashes. Those are good signs. Yeah. <laughs> no, it takes a while. It takes a while to warm up. Are they red and blue, or are they just yeah. <laughs> flashing red lights? Put the fear in most people too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, kind of question when you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm oh. just waiting for this to come on because then we can see a bigger screen picture of what oh, this is. Okay. So, um, what Sherry was saying. Is it possible then to, or is this too broad to do? Um, say we want all traffic crashes on from on two fifty seven from or Graham from like Greenwich Road all the way up to Stark within the last. That would be a pretty big map to bring in. What I would probably well, look at is breaking it down by intersection, so two five seven and. Um, you know, 257 and Columbia River Highway, 257 and Cherry Park, okay. 25, you know, look at it that way. And I think realistically, as if we were to look at the 
um, the data, what we'd find out is probably that there's not a lot of crashes between those major intersections. Yes. So we'd probably find out that a really big area like that, you'd have a lot of empty space where there was no data. So it, just paring it down to those intersections would probably give you uh, the better information. But is that when you have an address associated with the crash, is that really where the you crash occurred when, like you said, sometimes you meet the officer meets with them and they've pulled off over here. Maybe and sometimes is okay. the best answer. So, you know, it always depends because sometimes a crash may be called in from somebody who's inside their house and they see the crash outside. So the address is going to show their home address when the crash may be, you know, as an example, if someone called in a crash from inside Reynolds High School that they saw at Cherry Park in 257, the address of that crash will show at Reynolds High School because that's where the call originated from. Um, and you'd have to kind of pare down in the um, CAD information to find out that it was actually at uh, 257th and Cherry Park. But if a report is written, if a report's written, then don't we get accurate? In, okay, I guess. But the, Once the report's written, but that doesn't change the CAD data. The CAD data will always be the same. So the deputy is going to write the report that says here's where it occurred, regardless of where dispatch said it was the information was coming from. But that doesn't translate back into the data that we pull from, which is the CAD data. So what and we you can't pull from the other data only. We only could we could probably hand search all crash reports to identify exactly where all those crash crashes occurred. Um, but I would have to talk to our IT folks to see. I think actually we would get, we would get maybe worry about that if we, we find that there's crashes occurring at an intersection all the time, or it appears to be, but then we could get the real data and find out, oh, that's where they're getting called in from, but look at their, I mean, or, Vice versa. So then, maybe well, I was thinking could, it could be both ways. You could be getting extra data, or you could be getting missed data. Yeah. If so if you look at the screen for a second, I can give you an example. So this is uh, 257. So this is a, a blown up version of what you're seeing here in your top photo. Without, and I took away the heat part of it to so we could actually see the streets and things like that. Yeah. But the numbers are still the same. So as you can see, as you're looking at the the uh, map on the top, you can see it kind of just generally and broadly lists like 20, 24, 19, kind of there along yeah. 257. So by kind of zooming in on this, we can actually get a better look at, uh, for example, one that's always the talk is uh, 257 and uh, Columbia River Highway right here where it shows 10. So we can zoom in on that and get now we can see that there was really seven that 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 was listed as the actual 257 and Columbia River Highway were the actual address used by the caller when they called in and reported that that uh, crash occurred. And then you can see as you look at that breakdown that there were a couple over at uh, Halsey and uh, West Columbia River Highway and then there was a couple at Buxton. So we can pair that information down to be more specific at a specific location, but obviously it'd have to have some direction on what specific locations right. you wanted. And as a, in answer to, to, uh, to the earlier question, you can see that there's like a big stretch of 257 where there's no traffic accidents. So mm -hmm. what I would do is if you were interested in data on 257, I'd probably look at all these major intersections and see that like, here's one at the inter intersection of Chalkdale Terrace Apartments in 257. We have four that occurred at Sturgis in 257 and just kind of piece those together for you yeah. so you could see. Because I think the, the important data that you all probably are trying to get is where are the places where we have most of our crashes at? Right. Um, and so, you know, this is just kind of a broad overview that is able to show you the whole city and give you kind of a rough idea of, uh, of what that looks like. But obviously we can pare that down if you wanted specifics on a location. Hey, totally, probably not even related, but what are those question marks that are in black? 
Mm, I don't even know what those question marks are. Oh, it's a report that was written, but uh, it didn't wasn't associated with a crash. So it's saying that there was a report made here, but um, the didn't CAD data with... didn't. Yeah, the CAD data didn't direct it to be in a crash. So basically, what I'm doing to collect this data is I'm just doing a search on CAD data based on certain parameters, and the parameters I put in were the districts that in, encompass Troutdale, which for us is our 60 and 70 district. I give it a time period and tell it what kind of data I want. So I just basically picked every crash type that's listed in the CAD system. So this is a, a combination of non-injury crashes, injury crashes, hit and runs. This is every type of crash report that that BOIC has in their CAD, uh, in their CAD system to put out there, which there's about eight or 10 different crash types. So we could pare this down even more to say, we only want to know injury crashes that occurred. So we could pull up and just look at injury crashes, or we just want to know injury crashes and hit and runs. So we can pare this data down quite a bit. It's just going to be based on what your request is. Okay, but these are just crash related. Not... These are any cra any kind of crash. Okay, Anything so not that... you not you witnessing a speeding or a red light. And... No, okay. it's all it's all somebody called in and reported a crash, whether that was a injury, non injury, a hit and run, anything that hit that. Where when dispatch puts it in, they add a traffic crash or traffic accident code to it. So would it would it be a, a plausible statement that looking at the heat map again, um, and we've got let's for example, we have 257 in, in Halsey or Columbia River Highway. So we've got 80 uh, total and 20 reports. Yes. Okay. So would it be could, could we extrapolate uh, and then looking over by the airport, we got seven reports out of 11. Uh, crashes reported. So, could we say that maybe the area above and by the airport, that 7 and 11, there would be maybe more serious accidents up there? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable assumption to make is that, you know, reports are generally created on more serious, like um, injury uh, type crashes. Mm -hmm. uh, a substantial amount of damage to the vehicles. So that's why I think that report uh, where there's actually a report that written is right. the more useful data right. yeah. um, because it's showing those where it actually met the statutory requirements for for uh, writing a report, which includes injury, substantial damage, a fatality, um, a crash where there was uh, citations issued. So somebody had a traffic infraction or some sort of law violation that led to the crash. Yeah. So, yes, I, I think that's a good assumption to make is that that's your better data in that top photo there. And, and the, it's interesting that those are all, you know, intersection related. But then if you look on that road to the uh, east of the Sandy River, where there were uh, eight reports and uh, six requirement report. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily an intersection, is it? Or is that the Columbia well, uh, River Highway Bridge? Is that what that is? Or? Yeah, so that is uh, Columbia River Highway where you see this four and two over here. Yeah. So that's Columbia River Highway on the east side of. Uh, but not necessarily an intersection. Not necessarily an intersection, but I Driving bet if too we fast look, by tags coming if we the look, corner. Yeah, <laughs> if we look in there, you can see that like, um, there's residences along there, so you also got to take into account driveways right, that come out on the road. There's been some bad ones over the years by towns. And it's not, I mean, I don't want to indicate, I don't want to give you the impression that there's never a crash that doesn't involve an intersection. It happens. People drive too fast and they can't navigate a corner, things like that. So that happens. But particularly in actually in more, uh, Kind of the city and surface streets you see the majority of your crashes occur at intersections because people are driving slower generally and most of the incidents occur when there's an issue with traffic lights or stop signs or things like that um, when you get out on more kind of the 
uh, rural areas like you'll see on that that eastern side of historic Columbia River Highway that's when you have your crashes that are more related to speed you have more single vehicle crashes versus um, you know multi car crashes because people are just either speeding not paying attention on their cell phones have a tire blow out whatever the case may be mm -hmm. but you're in town crashes are are more frequently going to be intersection related I just have a question about the map. The green are like more refined and like the orange are like more summarized. Is that so the, I don't know what, I was so that, sorry, I should have been a bit I should have done a better job of explaining what a heat map does. I apologize. Um, so the more red is the larger number of incidents that it's reporting. So as you get out to green, that's cooler, that's less incidents occur in that area. So if you look at that top map, you'll see some of those areas, there's just a slight amount of green. Um, so probably what that's indicating is there was a crash that's reported and I'll give you an example down by the airport, there's that number seven. And you see that seven is surrounded in green and then there's sign of some yellow and some green. So what it's telling you is of those seven crashes, the majority of those seven occurred in that red area. And then as you get out to the green area, that's where less of those crashes occurred. Okay. So if we were to look at that kind of on the computer here, um, on the map there, we can see that you can kind of match that to your map out here on that, that left side, there was only three that occurred there. But if you go over kind of out here, there's five that occurred there. So that's going to be more that that hot area because there's more incidents there. Yeah. But as there's less incidents, it's going to cool in color. OK. But the numbers being like being in green and the numbers like being in yellow, it's just because it's a higher number. Higher it's, number, okay, yeah. That's a, okay, so that's a warning. Kind of, yeah, it's kind okay. of giving you that like the more red or the more brighter, the more hot color it is, that's the more incidents that are occurring oh, okay. there. Okay. The cooler colors are indicating less incidents. Okay. Uh, just for kicks, um, in that area, there's a 20. Which area? I'm sorry. Um, it's kind of just off of 257, and it might be closer. Oh, I see it on the map there, yeah. What's, um, kind of like, what's that? I'm having a hard time seeing with that glasses. So. Oh, there it is, 13. So seven. that's okay. basically this area right here. Oops, let me, right in that area. So let's kind of zoom in on that a little bit. So that's Reynolds High School. <clears throat> so you'll right. see that as you spread out, it breaks it out to more specifically where those occurred. And you'll see that it looks like there's a four there at Cherry Park in 257. There was three that appeared. So, and here's where it can be misleading. So they show to be at Reynolds High School. So they could have potentially been fender benders in the parking lot, or somebody could have called that in from Reynolds High School. But we're not 100% sure without actually pulling those reports and looking at the actual location that right. occurred. I was going to say, yeah, because where the three is actually showing would appear near the fields, not where the cars would be. But okay, I get it. Right. So, and, and you know, keep in mind, this is okay, kind of just an overview, a Google Earth overview. So it's not precise exactly going to show you the, the exact location that occurred, but it gets you in the general area. And when you look at things like the intersection there at Cherry Park and uh, 257, you can see that there was three crashes where we took police reports there. So that gives you a pretty good idea that we can kind of discount some of the wild ones that are over here and out here, but the important data is there's three that were clearly occurred and were reported there at 257 and, and Cherry Park. And you can do that at your other areas where you have kind of a, you know, a large amount. There's four there at Cherry Park, two, or 257 and Sturgis. Southwest Cherry Park. Um, so I think that's going to be the data that is kind of critical to you guys as you look at evaluating where most of the crashes occurred. Seven 
Yeah. Yeah, to uh, Columbia River Highway and 257. Um, is this information from like the last year? Or yes, that's year to date. Year to so date. that okay. year to date as of yesterday when I created this okay. report. So yeah, so for the whole year up till uh, December, what was yesterday, December 6th. Okay. So any other questions about that? So what I wanted to show you was a, an overall kind of heat map of the entire city. I wanted you to kind of get an idea because although not, not super specific information, it does show you that, you know, 257, if, if you look at that top and bottom map, it's pretty consistent that 257 does have more crashes based on the incidents reported than other areas of the city. So it does kind of give you a broad overview now, in looking at that, you can say, well, I want to be more specific. I want to see what actually happened at 257 and Columbia River Highway, and we can do that too. But um, in order to actually give you a full city view, so you have kind of that overview, it, it keeps it kind of broad like this, just because we're trying to map, map out and get the whole city on one piece of paper. So um, I will... Uh, leave that and then just let you know that if there is at some point in the future something you want more specific uh, location data on we can certainly get that specific for you Be before you go off this will you go back up to where stark and 257 are and zoom in a little closer in that area so there's Star almost where the little hand pointer is that's stark and uh, 257. Yeah. So you can see that there was eight, eight that more reports were taken there. There's some down here at uh, McGinnis and, uh, and Stark. And there's a couple of oddballs out here, um, which could potentially be in the neighborhood here, or because of the, the proximity this is to Stark, could have been where somebody called and said, I think I heard a crash yeah. on yeah. Stark. So those these two could very well have been here, but because of the way they reported, maybe these neighbors heard the squealing tires or something like that on Stark and reported them from their residence. But then there was a report written. Doesn't that mean that there's a report written? There is a report written, but remember, this is drawn from CAD data. So this, okay. at the end of the day, what this is, is dispatch got a call. They sent that call to a deputy. And the deputy cleared that call with saying that there was a report written. So as far as the computer system knows, there's no change in location. Now, if we actually pulled these out and said, we want to know exactly, like it shows us the case number there. So we could pull the individual, hand pull the individual case numbers, and that would have the actual location the crash occurred. Okay, and see those go back to now black question marks. Yeah, so I'd have to look and see what those cases were. Um, likely the question mark is because it's not recognizing the difference between where the call was called in and where the end report was written. So it might be um, identifying that disparity between the call location and the reported location. I was thinking if, if it gets cleared, then we could actually over report in an area that there's more crashes than actually happened. Or this could happen on the street and actually it's, I mean, it is a valid crash. I mean, <coughs> yeah, I guess there, no matter what, even if we get to a point where we want to drill down more, we might have to really analyze whether we want to proceed with like some action that we think, oh, this is becoming a big deal. We, we're going to have to look at ways to make an intersection safer, or, or I don't know, make a recommendation of something happening. Maybe we have to drill down more than at that time. Well, and I think it's a matter of looking at more than one source of data. As an example, like, you know, we can see right here that 257 and Stark has, shows to have eight crashes with report books written. Well, I just went over two pedestrian struck hit and run accidents that occurred in the area of 256 and oh, Stark. So, right. so as you're looking at data, you have not only 
this data that's kind of visible here, but you have the data as it's written in the log. So you're able to kind of to uh, corroborate that data and say, yeah, I can see there's eight on there. And I know that's probably fairly accurate because just this month there were two hit and run accidents there. So. And I just want to. So we really have to keep in mind, though, also the reports that really happened, the crashes that really happened, and no report really was written, but the crash happened. So you there talking. are certain, I mean, not every report have, is going to be written. So there are Yeah, there crashes. are. You're right. There's I so agree. That, yeah. that uh, number up here, the reports are written. Yeah. That does not mean that, you know, we st and look at the difference at some of these numbers. Right. It's quite broad. So. Yeah, and there's definitely something in, so the, there's a there, number there's in between than, here yeah, that we can't capture. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the number of times that, that maybe the crash actually occurred as, de as presented in this bottom picture, but it didn't meet the requirements for reporting as shown in the top picture. So there is an in-between picture here that what we can't really see. <laughs> The, there's injury, over fifteen hundred dollars worth of damage, a fatality, or traffic citations issue. All three of those, or any any one of those. Any one of those. Fifteen hundred. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Injury. Okay. Fatality. Okay. Or uh, uh, I think citations issue. Citation. I think there's okay. lots not getting written because people just move on from the accident. Cause I'm oh, sorry, you get in a little tiny tender bender, barely yeah. scratch. That's more than $1,500 of the damage. Well, yeah, the and shop nowadays. keep in mind that most people who have taken their driving test, the driver, the driver manual instructs them what to do. It says you pull to the side of the road, you exchange information and if, if nobody's hurt, you essentially move on and you back right. away. So right. a lot of people still do that. and. So you have a whole piece of crashes that are never reported, either by the people involved. Some of these that you see in this, the crash was reported, but there was no report generated, or because maybe somebody else called, not the people involved. They do their exchange and they go about their business. Yes. So by the time we get there, there's no sign that a crash occurred. There's nobody there to talk to, and they've just gone about their business so so it's hard to tell because in some ways if we're worried about an intersection or something we kind of gotta look at everything that's happened if there's been a crash there if there's even if they have moved on because then maybe it's it's gonna lead to more people getting hurt or, or somebody getting hurt at some point even if nobody has a this one it's kind of right. i guess it's hard there's it's no, no matter what it's hard yeah i mean the bottom line is there's no smoking gun data to say you know, what you got to look at is the data that we can provide and then make your own kind of determination based on that data, based yeah. on what you're able to see, which is, you know, not only being able to see this, this um, you know, uh, kind of graphic data, but also being able to look at the service log that we provide and then being able to look at the uh, crash report that, that goes into your packets every month every month where it actually shows here's the traffic accidents that were reported between November 1st and November 30th and you can actually go down there and you could make some kind of comparison to what that looks like on there so um, and this one actually breaks it down to as you look at it it'll say non-injury or unknown if injury or injury or hit and run so this actually breaks it down to specifically what type of crash was it? Because yeah. I think yeah. Boeck has, like I said, eight or 10 different crash types that yeah. they may enter based on the information they get. The other thing is they're only basing it on the information they get from, get from whoever may, may be calling. That's yeah. not always accurate. So it may be reported initially as a non-injury. So this data, as well as the data shown here, may show that as a non-injury crash. But when we actually arrive, we find out it is an injury. There is yeah. injuries there because the person was just driving by who called and they can't tell if there's injuries yes. or not. Um, and that's why you'll actually see some of these that say unknown if injury. And that's because somebody says, I don't know if anybody's injured yeah. when they call. Um, but a lot of times people will just make an assumption based on what they see. And they'll say, yeah, it doesn't appear there's any injury. Those going as non-injury crashes, 
and we may find out later that somebody is injured or somebody does go to the hospital or something like that. So um, it's a matter of just looking at all the data sources that you have and making a judgment based on that because, you know, without actually, uh, you know, putting up a camera there to watch that intersection and see what happens and having somebody watch hours and hours of video, you know, we're just using the best data that we can put together. Yeah. Um, so I heard, maybe I've heard uh, in previous conversations that, um, that there have been traffic studies completed on certain streets for speeding. Yeah. Um, so this would be something that we'd want to use in conjunction with this type of information to see, okay, um, what percentage of, of uh, vehicles are traveling uh, at or below uh, speed limits? And sure, it's another source of data that you could use by, by identifying if, you know, speed is a factor in those crashes. I would, I would say that generally speaking, when you're looking in town at intersection-based accidents, speed is not generally the factor it's usually red light running not paying attention those type of things um, as you look at like maybe crashes that occurred on the freeway you might see where speed might be more of a factor than it, than it is so um, also i think that data would be helpful if you were to identify someplace on surface streets in like a neighborhood a residential neighborhood where you see an abundance of crashes you know, those are the places where speed is often more of a factor than they are at intersections. So um, at intersections, speed could be a factor. I don't know you, that you would get a ton of value from putting a speed monitor measuring device out there just because you're going to get all the people that drove by there and sped or didn't speed when a crash didn't occur too. But you might identify that people more frequently speed through that area. So do we, I mean, this might not even be, this might be more than the cart before the horse. Do we even know um, sort of like the percentage or what we would expect to get into an accident on any given intersection in, you know, what do you mean? I don't understand the question. Well, I mean, like, I would believe there would be more accidents on 257th because it's a freight corridor. So mm -hmm. there's just so much more volume of traffic running that road. So to me, it would have more than, say, like, maybe Stark and 242nd or something like that. I sure. Don't know. Um, so I guess I wonder, like, when should I look at a number? Yes, I'm alarmed. I wouldn't want to be one of the seven people or eight people in that accident there or whatever. So I get that. But like, when should I be saying, whoa, that is so many more than the normal place would be? It would totally make sense for a camera as opposed to, you know, putting a camera, let's just say, for, you know, just. Well, I think that's all dependent on what you as a committee decide. Like, I would argue that there is no such thing as normal crashes. Normally, people don't run their cars under each other. Um, but what I would look at is data that is probably more impactful would be, you know, what's the percentage of injury crashes? Like, so if I'm looking at, say, for example, 14 crashes, and maybe I'm looking at 14 crashes at this other intersection, I would look at things like, are these, this particular intersection, are more of those injury? Are they more frequently injury? Which usually indicates a faster speed, they're driving at faster speed, things like that, versus, oh, these appear to all be just little fender benders where you know, people nick somebody's car or something like that. So I think I would look at those things that are, are where you're seeing a large amount of crashes, and now let's pare those down to how many of those are injuries? or how many of those are just fender vendors. And then, you know, we could even get to uh, a point where we actually say, okay, we've identified a particular intersection that we think is problematic, and we see there's 14 crash reports written. Can you give us a summary of those crash reports and tell us, like, are we talking minor injury or serious injury? So we have other sources of data that we can go to. But before we can do that, we have to pare it down to like, what are you actually looking to learn? So, um, yeah, I mean, 
I would assure you that anything that has access to the freeway is always going to have a higher number of crashes. There's a higher volume of traffic there. Mm -hmm. um, and if we were to spread this out countywide, I'm sure you could look at 207th and 181st and all those other places that have freeway accesses, and you're going to see that there's a larger number of crashes. But I think that's not information that, that we really need to provide in a data format. I think we all know where our high volume traffic corridors are, right? Um, 257 is one, um, Buxton at some points a day is high volume, Columbia River Highway is high volume. So you look at those places where we have two high volume traffic corridors meeting, you're definitely gonna have more crashes there. So you look at, <coughs> excuse me, a place like 257 and Stark or 257 and Columbia River Highway, those are both high volume traffic roads, you're absolutely gonna have a lot of crashes there. So now you gotta pare it down to like, are a lot of those fender benders or a lot of those, somebody's getting injured. And that will kind of help you identify those places where clearly there's a higher risk to the community because more people are getting injured in crashes there. Um, Boac, is that, is that the... Yeah, Boac. Is Boac have the cat data include um, calls for ambulance or you know, was somebody picked up and transported? Yes, I'm sure we could. So we don't have generalized access to fire data, but OIC does track fire data because they dispatch for fire and medical as well. So I'm sure you could, could request and we could likely get that data, but um, I wouldn't have easy access to that data, like where I could just pull it up and show it to you. So you might be able to share the contact with Victoria and I and we could ask them? Or yeah. How's that, how's that um, yeah, either that or I can reach out to my liaison. We, the Sheriff's Office has a liaison to Boic and see what the process is for collecting that data and is what they'll require. It, I imagine it's going to require a, a public records request. Okay. Um, so I can find out what the process is to that to get that data from that. I think it'd be very valuable to make sure that we have the same scale. You know, the same person pulling the reports and recorded and then you know, tra injury transportation. And keep in mind, Boek's not going to, aside from just the documentation that the deputy puts in when they clear the call, indicating that they're going to write a report, they're not going to have any of the report data. That's all maintained by the sheriff's office. So we'd have to provide you a report, uh, spe specific report data when it comes down to, hey, I want to know what the, even though I know it's reported to Boeck that there was 10 injury crashes here, I want to know when you actually went out there and took reports, how many of those were actually injury. That would be data that the sheriff's office would have to provide because Boeck's not going to know what we did once we got out there. Hey, one more thing about that intersection there at 257 and start. If there was a, a some type of a crash, and would ever Gresham go to it and write the report, and so he wouldn't, or that would still all be included in this BOAC? So these are called, these are specific to Troutdale, our Troutdale districts. So that means that when Bullock entered the call in there, they entered it in as a Troutdale incident. So meaning that whoever reported it gave them enough information to believe that it was in the Troutdale portion of the intersection or was related to Troutdale. Okay. So yes, if I were to add Gresham to this, the Gresham district to this and pull this up, you'd probably see that number go up substantially because now it would include any calls that Gresham responded to or that was dispatched as a Gresham call. So, you know, these are ones where, and, and I wanted to keep it this way, these are ones that were specifically dispatched to our deputies in Troutdale's, and that's Troutdale's 70s district. So in Troutdale's 70s district. Okay. <clears throat> um, Paul, do you have any questions or Carol? Uh, yes, thank you, Victoria. Uh, I had one specific, but I also wanted to say uh, someone was asking about what was going on 
at McGinnis and 24th. I believe that must have been the uh, rest of the fatal stabbing suspect. That was all over the news. That was even in the Oregonian. Um, my, I had a couple of questions. I think one of them was answered about the uh, the two hidden runs on Kendall Court. Sounds like those might have been walk-in reports. But my other question was, I noticed on uh, recovered stolen vehicles, there were two Kias on the same date on Elise Place, which happens to be in our neighborhood. So it's kind of curious if there's any idea, if the chief has any ideas why, how that would come about. Did you have recovered two vehicles on the same street on the same day and no arrests were made? Are you looking at the stolen vehicle report or the recovery report, sir? Oh, I see what you're talking about. I uh, recovered on Elise Place. <clears throat> yeah, I can't, uh, I can't give you an answer to that without actually, although I'm looking at the uh, report case number that's after it, and I see that that's the same case number. So that would indicate that um, both those vehicles recovered under the same case number. So I'd have to look at the report to uh, give you more details about that. And I don't have that report right here in front of me, um, but I can see they were both under the same case number. So it wasn't two separate incidents, but one incident where the vehicles were recovered. Okay, thank you. Carol, anything? Nope, I've got nothing. Um, then we'll move on to red light cameras, uh, data and timelines. And I was just wondering, do you want to ask for a study? Um, I, this is Carol. I would like to bring to the, the group that we do not do anything with red light cameras until they figure out 257th because any information we get right now may be very different um, once they do their improvements or whatever they're going to do on 257th. I agree. I would agree. Yeah, yeah I would agree too. Do you want me to move on to number seven? <laughs> I'm asking that the red light um, conversation get tallied probably until next year um maybe next year's new group that meets or in the spring um i just don't we have so much on our plate um of what we want to do and who we want to hear from that i don't think we should waste our time on red lights until um until they're done with 257 are you making a motion I am going to make, yes, I'll make an emotion. I'll, my motion is, is that we tally the red light camera discussion until 257th improvements are done. I'll second it. Um, I'm going to just add something. Um, they won't be done, but on, I'm moving to number seven for right now. I'm going to go back. Well, can we just address her issue? Don't well, we vote yeah, on? that's, that's this is part of it. Okay. Um, I, I spoke with um, Multnomah County. I talked to Sarah Hurwitz. <laughs> and she and uh, she's coming. And Stephen McWilliams are coming on February 1st. They'll do a presentation. Um, I told her the website's wonderful, but we had more questions. So um, we'll be able to ask any questions about the improvement on February 1st. So um, I agree we can table this. I don't know if we want to table it till they're done or till we hear them or. Well, question, aren't there other intersections in of 287 being looked at for red light cameras, then the ODOT improvement section from Cherry Park to start? Um, is it, that road is still called Cherry Park there too? It's that lower part of, it's Sturgis really. I think Sturgis on one side, it's referred to as Sturgis. Sturgis to start. 
Yeah. Are, are we looking at other, are we considering other intersections on 257 and other intersections? Well, even if we're looking at Cherry Park and 257, that's still, it's still 257. Yeah. So, so we're excluding three intersections. What? Oh, okay. I, I think we just don't want to jump to making some decisions on red light cameras when we don't even know what these improvements might do to the road. Maybe the accidents will make it, it really can happen down here and they'll hell have improved it and it's so good up there. Or maybe they have money. I don't know. I think and we I think don't that, know. I think, the, I think the data shows that we should we should not consider those three intersections, but there are other intersections that could still be considered throughout the city. Correct? Uh, we could ask for a study. Correct. On other on other intersections. But I think um, we asked him for some information on 257, but you're saying throughout the city, we have not received or processed the other parts of the information. We were just kind of looking at 257. So I think once again, that might be jumping ahead a little bit, at least in my book. I mean, gathering some more data about an area, I mean, in particular, maybe if we're talking about um, right here at the Columbia River Highway and 257, we could see a little bit of data there that shows that spot might have an issue. And we maybe could collect a little bit more information there, but are we engaging in a service that we're gonna collect some additional information and then we're just gonna pester for more? in six months from now or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I kind of feel like we have so many things that we want to do worry about safety on our committee that yeah, I, like I'm just still dying for the fire and the medical stuff that was so metrics. So I think we need to improve those more than we need to worry about red light cameras, but that's yeah. just me. I would agree. Okay, so do we want to vote on Carol's um um Motion. Motion. Did you have anything else to say on that, though? Well, uh, why don't we, I don't know. When did you want to table it to, Carol? The spring? Probably sometime in the spring. Yeah, that sounds good to me. We can decide. We can relook at it in the spring. Mm hmm So why don't we say uh, April? How's that? I mean, are we going to do anything on 257th between now and April? Well, no, but you can ask the questions exactly what they are going to do. The project manager will be here. And I know you had questions about um, up by the high school and everything. So I thought oh. it would be. I okay. thought it was good instead of me passing on the information that you guys could ask whatever questions you wanted. <laughs> so I'm a little confused because I see this as two different things. One is red light cameras in Troutdale. The other one, which I'm a little confused on is you're talking about 257th improvements. So you're talking about in, on February 1st, they were gonna come and talk about the 250 and 257th improvements, correct? Right. And you said you wanted to wait until 257th was done before we talked about red light cameras. Before the red light cameras, that's two different things, though, is it not? Because the update on 257th improvements, I think sh we should have them come and talk to us on February 1st. But no, I don't that... think we should have the red light camera discussion until later. No, that's what we're talking about right now. That's right. I was just letting you know if we... I'm I'm just saying if we wait till they're completely done, that could be two years from now. I don't know what their timeline is, but we can ask them when they get here. But yeah, I, I agree with you that we can table it until let's say April. But we'll be able to ask questions about what they're gonna do. I I almost I, I don't know. I think we need to table it longer than that because they won't have started. And I don't. We don't have to wait till they're totally done with the whole project. But I think we have to wait for a majority of the project to be done for see what, what safety things change. Well, I'm just saying you can ask them what they're doing. It's yeah. all well, planned we, out already. Right. 
That okay. way you know what they're doing. But I think the th project needs to be further done before we have the discussion of red light cameras. Do you want to amend it to? Okay, I guess what I just asked is clarification. My okay. clarification is the discussion on 257th improvements, they're going to come and represent, do a presentation on February 1st, correct? Correct. Okay, that I'm fine with. What I'm talking about is the red light discussion about cameras. That part needs to be like in the future. I'm right. talking, that's, I'm all good what, about that. That's them what you're saying. I was just saying we might not want to wait till they're completely done with 257 because that could be a couple of years from now. I'm, I was just saying we can ask our questions and then review it again in the spring. But if I could be so bold as to say, let's not say April. I think that we'd be revisiting it too soon. Okay, pick a date. I don't think we can pick a date. I think we have to, I, I am looking forward to the presentation on February 1st. I think that'll be a great conversation to have. We could maybe then, if we had questions in their presentation um, about the red light, if they bring it up, I'm all for that. But what I'm saying is great in-depth discussion um, and getting all the data should wait for the future. Now, whether it's okay. April, so what I'm saying, if it's April or it's in the fall, that conversation needs to happen later. Yeah, that's fine. We just need, if we're tabling it, we need to pick when we're going to bring it up again. So, And we can table it again. And if we did it in April, we can table it again in April, or we can pick September right now. It's, well, right, but so, we need it in the motion. So hold on. Okay, so I'm... So I'll amend my motion. Yeah, just a motion. Just a minute, just a minute, because is there, Carol, I know that you do not want red light cameras. I do not, but I am interested in the data, but I am not. Is there any, any data that would help you change your mind? No. So then why are we waiting for data? Well, I would, my mind might change okay. with data. Yes. I'm a data-driven gal. Understood. Understood. Mary. Can we just agree tonight to listen to the people that are going to be coming to 257 improvements on February 1st, hear them out, and revisit this and see what information they have. We should probably listen to what they have to say. Maybe it will go, oh, okay. You know, I don't know. But let's... Well, I think we should uh, listen to them and then maybe in March revisit this and set a date for more information, and revisit the red light and see if we should just put it off for you know, well, a year or. So if the majority of, of the committee doesn't want to have red light cameras, then we should tell the council what our decision is we don't need to wait any further. We don't need to look for more data, right? We can tell them now that there's no amount of data that's going to change the majority of the committee's mind. And I'm not sure I want, I'm not sure which way. I would I like to revisit things a little right. bit yeah. more. Okay. Um, Woodrow, I think I'm the only one that's very adamant against it, but I love to hear what people, what the data shows. I am. I mean, I love to learn, and if it shows anything different, I am willing to change my mind. I'm just saying, so let me just amend my thing here. Okay. So I am looking forward for February 1st. I suggest that we curtail the red light camera discussion till April. And then in April, we can decide whether we want to move that further or not. Okay, and right. can I just say one thing? April might be just a fine time. The only reason why I think it maybe should get pushed a little bit further is because we talked about all these other things 
that we want people to come in and talk to us about. And I feel like the, some of those things were pressing, like Shelby indicated. Um, and I feel like we keep trying to put this one in there and then it's at the expense of not hearing the other. So if I could interrupt for just a second. So my understanding is there's a motion. Yes. A motion made. So that motion would need a second and a vote. And then if there is uh, if some if that motion doesn't pass and somebody has an alternative motion, then um, but I don't know that it's having a discussion and negotiating the motion. I think that the motion's already been put out on the table. And right. so okay, it's thank you. Shelby had already seconded it, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we just need it. What day did you say now, Sarah? April. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. So. So now you need to vote. Right. So all in favor? Aye. To table Aye. April? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Woodrow. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. So we will table that until April. And now an update from the Public Safety Services Delivery Group. Um, we finished our work and Ray is going to present it to City Council. No, uh-uh. Tanny, Tanny and I are presenting it to City Council. Oh, I'm sorry. Ray's going to be there, but Tanny and I are, are, are presenting it. Okay. Thank you. I, I thought Ray sent me this thing. I thought he was presenting it. Okay. Not that I was aware On of. Tuesday night, <coughs> City Council. So you can come on down or it will be on TV. If you have cable, the channel 30, I think. Um, or you can listen to it later. <laughs> but um, we're going to present things for um, fire and police. So. so do you want me to tell you what we decided? Yeah. I want to hear yeah. It. Oh, go <laughs> ahead. I was going to read it, but go ahead. <laughs> OK, so. Um, Recommendations from to City Council from the Public Safety Working Group regarding information to be gathered to assist in determining the best path forward for Troutdale Law Enforcement, July 1st, 2025, forward. So, um, I mean, I could read this word for word. It's two pages, but basically... Um, we talked about hire review and hire consultant to compare current service level, get information from similar size cities regarding service levels and determine what is desirable and recommended. Um, we talked about increasing LE in um, Troutdale is desired. Consider the type of cost of lower cost alternatives to sworn LE personnel for LE duties, not requiring sworn in, which means like park ro park rangers, um, private security for parks. Chief, do you have one of these? No, I do not. Okay. Um, it also says red light cameras, et cetera. Um, request a bid from city of Gresham for sworn LE services. Um, after desired FTE level of service determined, require a bid from Multnomah County for desired level of LE services. We, you know, we also talked about services that we are paying for and services that we are paying, like we are paying for, but not getting. And then, um, you know, are there services that we're getting that should be paid for? Um, Request a consultant to prepare estimate for one-time startup costs to recreate 
the Troutdale Police Department and an annual uh, general fund budgetary cost of TBD um, at the desirable LE service level coordinate with Wood Village and Fairview to include them in additional financial um, analysis of creating a larger three cities police department. If I was there, you guys, I would have copies for all of you. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then determine what is baseline um, of LE services that we are currently getting. I'm um, getting a report from MCSO of percentage of time is in district versus out of district. Um, and sometimes I believe Chief already kind of goes over that with us about, you know, this happened in Fairview, this happened in Wood Village. It's just um, getting more information. Um, current comparison of discretionary versus non-discretionary time for pat patrol duties in Troutdale. Um, get analysis done by commercial real estate broker to determine the market value for leasing Troutdale Police Community Center and recommendations for appropriate lease terms. Um, get greater clarification to ensure as much control and value as possible in a future contract. So, um, you know, Troutdale wants to, wants to have a say, right, in our police. Um, Paul? Uh, thank you, Kira. I was just going to mention everything you're reading is in the... Uh council packet for their next meeting. Yeah, but a lot of our our um, committee members don't attend city council. Well, they it's in, it on, it's in the, online, online. the online packet. This is on the online packet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. Um. So that's um, fire, then the other one, or that's um, uh, police, and then the other one is fire. And it fire's um, sh a lot shorter, but fire is uh, review current service levels and response times and determine what is desirable. Um, request a consultant to determine likely financial import impact of voter approved new fire district or annexa annexation of fire district 10. Um, and what is the impact on the citizens and the city general fund and coordinate with, with uh, Wood Village and Fairview for cost sharing, request a bid from city of Gresham for a new 10 year fire contract, request a bid from city of Gresham um, we want to have, have a say in Gresham when they come over because we don't have a say right now. Gresham makes all the decisions um, and we just go along. Um, review current contract and determine additional terms to better define contract level of service and then schedule Gresham fire and emergency services chief to appear before the council in the first quarter of 2024. Um, so that's on both of those and those will be read and discussed at the city council on Tuesday. Um, thanks, Paul, for bringing that up. I didn't know it was up there. Um, so we, we had great discussion on both of these things and um, my take, you know, our take on it is we love our police officers. And, you know, Multnomah County is doing a wonderful job. Um, you know, we'd like to see them more in Troutdale, obviously, right? So um, that's that. Um, fire, so that was another thing I was going to bring up as we're discussing this. And um, Victoria, we've been asking to have fire come and do a um, presentation to us now for a year. Okay. I, I've been in contact with them twice in the last month. They are very busy. If you've read Gresham Outlook lately, you can see things that are going on. Um, 
They said if they do not get back to me by the end of the year, for me to contact them again. So I will do that. Um, but I have been, I tried, but I couldn't, I couldn't get them. So did, did Mayor Lark say that if we wanted information from Gresham Fire, we need to come to a council meeting? Because apparently he has, he has Gresham Fire Chief come to our council meetings. Well, they're um, going to, they're going to request it. They're going to request it in 2024, but they normally come like once a year, but he hasn't been there. He, I don't know if he came in 2023 or not. And they used to come here too. Right. And I did mention that they used to come here trying to spur that maybe. Um, she, I, I didn't get a no. I just got that they, um, both the chief and the assistant chief are very busy right now. And they had just lost a firefighter. And um, quick question. So. Um, so Gresham Fire Chief is in Gresham. Who's who's in charge of our little firehouse over here? That's Gresham. But is it a captain? Is it a battalion chief? Who's who's in charge of the crew in Troutdale? For um, Fire Station 72. Paul, do you know? No, I don't. Yeah, I I just know that it's all run by Gresham. That seems like that's the person we should talk to. Well, he won't have all that. All right. Got it. So I'm working on that. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm worried that they might just say we'll have to go to the council meeting, but we'll maybe, maybe see what we can do. Have it in somehow. Yeah. yeah. Is that doing there? He's inside. Okay, next discussion on the community feedback questions and how the committee would like participants to respond. I went online and Googled. There's lots of good little surveys we can take questions from. Our question, uh, our thing we want to discuss, do we want to do it online, in person or by mail? By mail would probably be expensive, well, not super expensive, but would cost money. We can do it the in-person way you were talking about, like going to First Fridays mm -hmm. and other public events and having it be like cumulative. So we could do it for like <laughs> four months. And- I mean, honestly, this is, this is to help us Sometimes so, the words don't all come smoothly and easily for me. And so if we have a script, when I go <laughs> and knock on somebody's door, I, I don't sound like the moron that I really am. <laughs> 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 it helps me out. Little cue cards, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm here to help you. <laughs> so, or we can do it online. But we have to get the word out and get it in the paper and everything that it's online. <laughs> yeah. or, again, and also just reinforcing with our with our community members. You know? Yeah, I feel like if we had just almost like a work session where we can throw out ideas on ways to do it, because I still I go back to the same thing. There's a possibility that, you know, somebody doesn't read the champion or they don't <laughs> something else but maybe I go look for the champion and it's empty. I have to pull the little, the little blue boxes, right? And that where it's at? I don't know. Oh, I, I Come to the know. mail to me. Come to oh. the mail to me. <laughs> but but I'm meaning more so that it can be in that, but if you haven't read it, like maybe you open up your water bill. And I know some people don't. If you get online to pan, maybe there's a big don't forget to fill out the survey, you know, or something. So again, not like everybody will do it, but even if we got, you know, 500 to 1,000 people, that'd be a lot more than maybe has. So. And after this, tell me how I can get a copy of Champions. It's like, apparently, look at all the wrong places. You didn't get the Troutdale Champion delivered to your place? I don't. My place has wheels. Maybe it comes as a something, a bolt. Oh, okay. 
beautiful residential area down there. Thank you. Knocking somebody else's door. There you go. Who runs the place? Yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Who does run the place? <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, we're getting a little crazy, aren't we? The raccoons run the place. <laughs> okay. So does anybody have any other suggestions for this right now, or you want to discuss it next month? Next month is wide open. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to come talk this month. <laughs> yeah, um, we could, you know, I like your idea, Victoria. Maybe we discuss this and discuss what kind of questions we want to ask um, on the 4th of January. Does anybody else have feedback on that? Sure, that sounds good. Sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah, and if you go on and Google community surveys for safety and things, you'll find all sorts of interesting questions. And we can just whittle it down. And we can, there's some on equity too. So you have to do them separate. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll discuss that next month. <coughs> so you want to confirm next meeting date is the fourth? Yep. 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 Good for me. That's uh, works for me. Just uh, be aware that um, the um, packets for that won't be available till the second. So right. you'll have short turnaround from the time you get the packets till the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I still didn't have, have mine today's mail. So I'm going off of the one that's online. But you didn't have a packet? No. No. I don't get it in the mail either. Are you yeah. talking about mail or email? I'm talking about this I get packet email. that you all get. Yeah, I always get the email. Yeah, so mine graciously arrived in the mail today. And okay. as I know, it had to have come today since you said you included this lovely picture as of yesterday. Yes. And my mailman's good, but they ain't that good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably get it tomorrow. Okay. So we confirm the meeting. We'll discuss the community feedback questions. Um, anything else you want to discuss that day? Um, actually, if I didn't get an opportunity to address the other question that was asked at the previous meeting, and I wanted to take a, the opportunity to address the, the question that uh, Paul asked. Um, so if it uh, pleases the committee, I can go over that real quick as well. Okay. Um, so first off, in answer to Paul's question, he asked about those two stolen vehicles that were recovered. On the 30th, I was able to pull up a copy of that report. And so a deputy was dispatched to a suspicious vehicle that appeared to be stolen at that location. The deputy went to that location, found that that vehicle was stolen. So he recovered that vehicle. And while doing his investigation, he checked the vehicle that was parked directly behind that vehicle and found that one to be stolen also. So he did in fact, or the deputy did in fact, recover two stolen vehicles parked one right behind each other, both unoccupied and appeared to be abandoned. Nice wow. Sure. Is that, uh, is, was that the information you're looking for, Paul? Yes, that's, that's perfect, thank you. Yes, no worries. Um, I also wanted to make a correction. I, as I was sitting here, I think I said, uh, 1500 for that amount for the uh, the the traffic crash report. I apologize, it's 2500. Okay. Oh, so wow. I don't know why I had 1500 stuck in my head, but that's the old number from years ago when I was still working patrol. So <laughs> it's now 2500. All those other things still uh, apply, whether there's injury, fatalities, or citations were issued. But the, the amount was what I wanted to correct. Um, and then the last thing I had was last meeting, there was a request about how to utilize the crime reporting map on the sheriff's office website. Um, so if I could share my screen again real quick. All right. So 
This is the Sheriff's Office website. When going to quick access or, or hovering over quick access, you can go to the crime dashboard, click on that link. It brings up this crime dashboard, which is obviously shows the entire county, all, all sections of the county that we patrol. So you would wanna go up to patrol jurisdictions if you wanted to specify this down to Troutdale and select Troutdale. It then narrows this down to where you can just see uh, the different areas and neighborhoods in Troutdale. It will give you a type, different types of crimes, person crimes, property crimes, society crimes. You can do this by date. So this happens to be for uh, the last month, so November 1st through November 30th. But you could put whatever dates up in this area that you wanted to select to view that. You can also put specific types of crimes. So if you wanted to see just person crimes, just property crimes, you have a drop down box that gives you the opportunity to do that. If you wanted to narrow it down even more and you wanted to actually see by crime type, so you wanted to see if it was a uh, burglary or only arsons, you could narrow it down by selecting those to see uh, specifically what uh, what crimes were committed if you're looking for a specific one. As a, and as you can see over here on the right side, it gives you a list of those, uh, kind of a summary of those types of crimes based on what you've searched. And then you can narrow that down even further by selecting a neighborhood. And it'll talk about that particular area of the city and what types of crimes were reported there and just give you that summary there. Um, so it's actually pretty simple if you, you know, as you, cause it, if, as long as you select Troutdale, it's going to give you that month's overall view of all crimes reported in Troutdale. And then you can actually use the, the drop down menus here to select more specifics. If you'd like to, you can also use the date start and end date boxes to add, um, or to refine the date time, the date you're looking at um, as much as you want. Is this where you pull the data from too? No. Okay, so that incident I talked about before on 1125, would it show up on here in my neighborhood? Um, it may. Um, I, have to, I haven't reviewed it to see if it did or didn't, but it may. But I will, I will say that I think Paul, um, mentioned that that incident was the uh, SWAT arrest of the individual involved in a fatal stabbing in Gresham and Paul's correct. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, and I did not, I don't watch a bunch of that news. So that's why I'm unaware of it, but yeah, many didn't seem to be aware of it. So yeah. it feels like it wasn't just me. All right. Uh, committee member comments. Tell me. Um, let's see. Um, do you know if we're going to have a staff person assigned to us by the city? We were. I think we brought that up last month, didn't we? Um, not yet. Not yet. Okay, but we're looking into it. Maybe. Well. Okay. Okay. Sarah will let me know if somebody can do it. So. I mean, I just thought it was a lot for the chief. I always have to worry about all aspects of it, the secretary and you having to take minutes. So anyhow, um, okay, well, uh, I'm very anxious for the future when we get the information on fire and the volleys. That's just a big deal to me. Otherwise, Merry Christmas to everybody. Where <laughs> go? Great lady, great input. Thank you for your time. Of course, thank you. Um, Victoria, do you want me to reach out to AMR? I go ahead, okay. but I think they're having a lot of trouble right now too. They're getting um, fined and so I, I got the hiring one. problems. So. I got the well. On a side note, uh, we'll take track that we'll be getting a Cub Scout pack and a Boy Scout troop again. So we found a uh, we found a. Uh, Chartered organization that will will sponsor them, and we reached out to the schools. Um, I've got a meeting scheduled next week about an explorer troop so that we can work with 
chief and uh, possibly give a pipeline to some that are interested uh, older scouts into law enforcement. So that's a, a, a promising thing. Uh, but then also the uh, the scholarships that we have for uh, scouts when to go into EMT or media. Um, very, very positive. And I talked to the mayor Ryan just briefly about all that work. Um, so yeah, we have got a few more hurdles to get through. Um, but we're chipping away. So come come from. Mary. I just want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Of course. And Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. And yes, Merry Christmas to all. Thank you. And thanks for my notebook. Uh, I, I did follow up on that, and Sarah was already doing them. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in case you're jealous, Carol, I don't know if you can see it, but here it is. Yours is here, Carol. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the other thing, I, oh, here, I'm oh, sorry. Um, I noticed that there wasn't any minutes. Are are we going to have minutes since we, I know that, um, Victoria, you're trying to take notes, but are we going to have notes that are, um, included in our minutes? I'm not sure, but I think Sarah has been trying to do those. So they might be a little bit late. We don't have anybody assigned the minutes right now. And did I understand you say that we don't know if we're going to have a staff person that comes? I don't know yet. If I could uh, address that, you do technically have a staff person. That staff person is out on leave, um, extended leave. And so, you know, in looking at how we backfill that position, we have to be considered of the HR rules that cover people who are out on leave and backfilling positions and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, as we navigate those rules, we'll look at, um, at how we backfill that position. But at this time, we don't have a position that or a opening to fill that position right now, because that position is technically filled. Okay, thank you for your clarification. Um, I also wanted to bring up how um, the toy drive, you guys, I was really happy um, how the toy dr drive went with with you all. And I loved the um, helping the homeless thing in, in the um, little article. So I appreciate all that you guys do. I know sometimes our committee can be frustrating. I know I can be, but um, I, I just appreciate all the work that you do and and all the sheriffs that are around that you know do as well i do wish um, everybody a merry christmas and um hope you all have a wonderful next three weeks thank you for uh mentioning the toy drive uh, that was a humongous success it was uh it was a a collaboration for all the east county cities and i just wanted to share that all the, the donated toys and items will be given out to needy families in East County. So nice. uh, that was an important part of that, making sure that that those efforts uh, were felt by people who needed it within East County communities. So thank you for mentioning that. You bet, nice. And then uh, Victoria, just one more thing. Um, I appreciate you reaching out to everybody to try to get them to come. I encourage you not to um, stop calling because um, they all owe us a visit. AMR owes us a visit, fire. We've been lucky to have um, Chief fill us in, but um, I wouldn't stop being a door knocker. Oh, I, I'm not, but I, I am going to do what they asked them right to the beginning of the year. So, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> one more thing on February 1st. So our agenda is going to be very full on the 1st. We'll have our monthly law enforcement reports first. And then um, Multnomah County will come in and talk about 257. And after that, Ray Young is coming in 
and talking about the emergency plan. I asked him about CERT too. I put, can you talk about CERT? And any questions that you might have on our direction, our committee direction. So he will be here and he'll speak after the Multnomah County. Can, <coughs> I mean, I, I love it that it's gonna happen. There's no way he could come next month instead. No. I I gave three months of dates and that's what I okay I just worry because you know we talk usually with the chief close to an hour well so I'm like... figuring half an hour okay and then Multnomah County will be 30 minutes to 45 minutes and then um Ray can have the rest okay we'll report to you that on the first on the 1st of January? February. February. Oh, 1st of February. Yeah, um, I, they won't be available for your, like, because your packets are going to come out prior to that. I don't get the reports until the first day of the month. Mm -hmm. That's not a holiday or something like that. So I'll have to have those emailed out to you probably on that, the day of okay. the meeting. So I'll talk to Sarah and make sure she gets them as soon as I get them, and maybe she can send those out via email so you'll have yeah. uh, access to them. Yeah, I was gonna say for me, then it'd be fine. I'll just see them here probably. Mm -hmm. Just try and pop in a little bit early. Yeah, and I know Sarah always makes sure there's packets that include yeah. Yeah. all the data. Okay. And I do wanna thank Sarah because she did the notebook, she sets everything up. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciate her. <laughs> she has been amazing in taking on the extra workload that. Yeah. that uh, isn't normally her workload, so. And I am not sure about the minutes, but I will ask her. I, I know I signed some, but they were from a while ago, so. And I wanna wish everybody a Merry Christmas, good discussions, and I need a motion to adjourn. My motion we adjourn. Okay. Motion by Shelby, second by Woodrow. Yep. Oh, we didn't get to. Does Sandy want to say anything? Uh, oh. No, I was just going to say good night. Have a happy holidays. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Sandy. No, better. You're all.